who, who are the two great intellectual gurus, if you don't mind the word guru, intellectual authors of the American right in our time? Well, there might be an argument about which the top two would be, but in any group of the top three or four, you'd have to include Leo Strauss, and you'd have to include Ayn Rand. And in all the arguments about the politics and the interstitial politics of the present administration, for example, it's now become commonplace to point out, sometimes inaccurately or with, with um, exaggeration, the debt owed by Paul Wolfowitz in particular and the neoconservative school in general to Leo Strauss. And I suppose everybody knows that the uh, man who has controlled the Federal Reserve through many, many administrations, Mr. Alan Greenspan, is an unrepentant member of the family of objectivists made up by Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon, who we used to meet to discuss the Fountainhead and at the Shrugged. And you wouldn't be able to tell in general, perhaps, from the presentation that the Republican Party gives to the country that its intellectual muscle is provided by unbelievers, but such is the case, such is the fact. Leo Strauss, I think we could define as a, as a non-believer rather than a positive infidel or unbeliever. He had a sentimental uh, reverence, shall we say, or respect for belief, but he couldn't achieve it himself or respect it too much in others. And I suppose Ms. Rand could be described as a Nietzschean in some ways because she thought that um, religion, all of it, but particularly Christianity, uh, was a religion for slaves. And I don't agree with her about that because, it was for, if only because for such a long time Christianity was the religion of slave holders and slave takers and slave traders as well as, because we must be fair, for abolitionists and campaigners against slavery. So don't mistake me, I don't propose any simple-minded Nietzscheanism here, but I do want to propose the concept of the anti-theist as opposed to the non-theist or the agnostic. The anti-theist, such as myself, someone who's hostile to the idea of religion, takes no position as between different faiths. Uh, we maintain that the pluralism of faith, the extraordinary pluralism of faith and, and the schism within existing faiths, the number of churches all claiming uh, to have, or, or if not churches, synagogues or mosques or gurdwaras or temples, uh, claiming to possess or open an avenue to the truth and competing with one another is susceptible of a, a very simple explanation. The pluralism of religion is attributable to the fact that man created God and not the other way around. If you accept the posture that man makes gods, there is no mystery in the proliferation of gods and religions that has always existed in human society. If you, on the other hand, accept the idea that God made man, such a phenomenon is inexplicable, especially if you add, as so many do, that God made man in his own image. In other words, he must have made an image of someone extremely schismatic, if not in fact schizophrenic. <laughs> the only ones in this argument, therefore, who have to be wrong, who must be wrong, for whom there's no help and no excuse, are those humans, mammals, fellow mammals like ourselves, made of the same errant and uh, torpid and sinful flesh, as ourselves, who claim that they do know the mind of God and his intentions and indeed his minute instructions on private and public behavior. Only those who affirm this must be, by definition, ab initio, mistaken. And if I was a religious person and I heard someone, or a spiritual person, and I appear not to have the gene that is required for this, and I heard someone talk in this way, I would in that instant recognize profanity and blasphemy. No fellow mammal, no one who I know is at least made in the same image as I am, I know myself reasonably well, is going to tell me he knows what God's will is. That must be profane even to the spiritual and the religious. It is certainly very deeply offensive uh, to the active uh, rationalist mind because of its arrogance no less than because of its impossibility. And if I've made this simple point of repudiation clear, um, I still haven't carried my point about the moral imperative of anti-theism or unbelief, which I'll now try and carry, or at least to assert. 
What if then, if it was true, without, or shall we say, um, against, you, you choose, either against the evidence or without any evidence, but what if it was true nonetheless, could somehow ontologically be established as true, that we are all part of a grand divine design? What would that actually mean if it were to be true? Well, it would mean a regime of permanent supervision and surveillance over our lives and our personalities that never stopped, that began before we were born, went through every moment of our earthly life, and continued after our deaths. An inescapable authoritarian surveillance, control, and Supervision. It would be like living in a celestial North Korea. <laughs> I've been to, I've, one of the very few people who've been to and written about North Korea, which has now transformed itself from being a, um, an atheist totalitarian state into a fully religious quasi-Confucian uh, state of worship of the reincarnation in the sun, in Kim Jong-il, of the father, uh, Kim Il-sung. You have only one right as a North Korean. That is the right to praise your leader and to thank him for everything he's done for you and everything he's done for everyone you know and to continue praising him and thanking him all the time without cessation for these benefits and this shower of gifts. In other words, in North Korea has been manifested the promise of the Christian, of the Christian paradise a permanent system of praise for something that, after all, you didn't choose to have. There's a difference. You can die and leave North Korea. You can, if you're very, very brave, you, you have a, a very small chance of a physical escape, of a defection from North Korea, an option more and more people are exerting. But in the celestial paradise, where you have only the right to praise and the right to thank and the right to give thanks and then the right to give some more praise, or something that was never in your power to refuse, uh, there would be no escape. So what I want to ask myself, often do ask myself and do ask people who claim to believe, is why do you want such a thing to be true? What a hideous realm of permanent, total, inescapable unfreedom is being proposed to you. Thank God, I will say for the first and last time, that there is no evidence at all that we do live under any such system of surveillance control, supervision, and the compulsory exacting of our facts. And bear in mind, and some of you I'm sure will get this point, how much worse that system would be if it was benign, if it was run by someone who was kind and for your own good. That would be even more horrifying and degrading than to live under a, a diabolic exaction of the sort. Hence, I think, because this is the origin of totalitarianism, not in our outside world, where it's menacing enough, but within our own minds, the struggle to throw off this servility is the precondition for any struggle for liberty, whether intellectual or personal or moral. And to some of us, the idea of such a subjection, an infinite, inescapable subjection, is revolting, the more especially because it is preached by fellow mammals who have no special claim to knowledge or wisdom, who clearly want to exert power and ask yourself this question as I ask it to myself.